This whole show is going to be exciting. We are counting down some of the best rivalries in history, and Rusty Wallace will be on our show. Something tells me that Hall of Famer may make our list once or maybe even twice. <laughs> yeah, real good chance of that. Thanks, Alan. We're looking forward to Rusty Wallace joining us. But first, let's take a look back at some NASCAR history to figure out exactly what makes a rivalry. Donnie Allison throws the block. Kale hits him. They're hitting the wall. And there's a fight between Kale Yarbrough and Donnie Allison. The definition of a rivalry is when two competitors are going at it and they truly just don't like each other. A rivalry is when you have two people that are really good at what they do and they want to argue about who's better at it. The NASCAR rivalry is when you have two drivers that just seem to always find themselves on the racetrack running into each other, competing for the same spot, making contact, usually for a win. Zedbert's going to oh, he turns it! No, no! When you have two guys that are competing for the same space, that don't see eye to eye, it really infuses the level of competition. They're everything to our sport. They are the reason that fans tune in. They are the reason that drivers raise their game to go out there and to beat the guy that they don't like the most. I'm glad I'm the second man to won, if not the first. Growing up, when you got to see someone get in someone's face, it was awesome. And I'll be waiting when he comes in here. Contact! And he's just, he's just a dip He came up, hit me in the rear, and then he came up to my window and punched me. I think with some drivers, you have a us versus the world mentality. Get it, they tie it! Hamlin's got it! Hamlin's got it! Which can be really helpful for a team and for a race car driver, but sometimes it comes to reality, and that's when you see a driver have multiple rivalries. It's probably not his fault, you know, his wife wears a fire suit in the family and tells him what to do, so. This is gonna get ugly, it's gonna get ugly down here, boys! That's how Joey races, so he's gonna get it. Fans get more excited about the race car driver if uh, it's him against the rest of the world. You got two fan bases going at it against each other, and that's why they show up to the race, to see their guy beat the guy that everyone doesn't like. Brad knows the deal between him and I. He ain't gonna kill my boy. You have guys that argue over who's the best, that's what makes it fun. You throw a rock, I'm gonna throw a concrete block back. I'm gonna bust his ass. Didn't mean to really turn around, meant to rattle his cage over. I believe rivalries are built over time by drivers that have had a great deal of success in the same era that for whatever reason maybe didn't get along. And that enhanced what we see on the track. I've been through a lot of rivalries. I'm still here fighting. It's not gonna change the way I race. Race with 100% intensity and go for the win and that's what our fans deserve in NASCAR. 70 years of rivalries, 70 years of NASCAR history, and that's just one part of this sport that makes it so popular. So, guys, what really is the answer here? What makes a rivalry? Well, one thing that I will say, I do not believe that a rivalry is a one-time run-in or a one-time incident. True. I think it's something that starts and it builds over time. It's acknowledged by the competitors. It's acknowledged by the fans. And it doesn't have to be beating and banging and wrecking. We have seen some friendly rivalries where you just have – fierce racing week in and week out, which honestly is the type of rivalry I enjoy the most. Yeah, and, and it doesn't always have to be at the front of the field. I think when it is at the front of the field, we notice it more so. But guys can build that rivalry by racing for 15th or 20th or 10th or wherever it may be. It seems like you always find that one guy that can just get under your skin, that can irritate you, can really just get your blood boiling. And, and he's always seat. right next to you. Absolutely. <laughs> he always yeah, finds even, you. You know what the best thing about a rivalry is? Drivers have a tremendous, tremendous memory. If you just nudge them somewhere, They'll think, why'd he do that? I won't let him do that again. And it starts to build like that. And then the war of words takes over. Man, you've heard some creative barbs being jabbed back and forth to each other. So just the, the fact that you can race side by side on the track, rub a guy the wrong way, and then talk about him after the race. Don't respect, don't disrespect me. I won't take it. And it never fails. After you have a problem with a guy on the racetrack, you're going to ride with him the next week during driver <laughs> yeah. intros. You're going to be right or next to him. the teams will be parked right beside each other in, in the, the garage, garage. Yep. That, that always happens. And we have a driver coming up on our top 10 list that reminded us that he never forgets. Mm, you remember that, don't you? Now it's time to kick off our top 10 countdown and let's explain how we got here. All votes were submitted by members of our NASCAR on Fox on air broadcast team. Each member tabulated their personal list ranked in order from one to 10. So each number one pick got 10 points. Each number two pick received nine and so forth. So let's take a look at the first two rivalries on our list featuring some of the top names in the sport right now. Bam. Oh, hard hard for the wall. He got a little nudge from behind. Biffle in the Yikes. 60 car. Yikes. Boots him. 
You know, I always said Greg Biffle was a good guy, but uh, he's about the most impatient thing. I'll be waiting when he comes in here. Here we go. And this is Kevin Harvick going after Greg Biffle. Kevin! Kevin! You have seen how fenders and tempers can fly here at Bristol. Little bump by the Biff on the back of the number 29. Look at the 29 run up and run into Biff. These guys are having words. He didn't like that at all. I don't care. I'll wreck as many cars as I need to. I believe he's got him this time. Oh, he turned him! No! Oh, he turned him! Oh, no. no! I ran hard and got wrecked. I ruined his night and, you know, probably uh, ruined my career. Whether it's fair or not, he's going to need some security. Oh, we got more than that. He basically just dumped him. That is Brad walking directly toward Kyle Busch's pit. He didn't want me to race him hard, so he just dumped me down the straightaways. I'm not going to stand for it. Ooh, Chloe wide into turn four. That moves Kyle Busch all the way up the racetrack. Hey, calm down, calm down. And Kyle Busch is going to turn on, the and bring the championship on, contender Hornaday in the wall. Trouble comes for number four to Kevin Harvick. Kyle Busch bouncing off each other. Oh, we just got to find 18. Harvick is in the fence. This has just started now. And we know Harvick is in. He plays rough. Wheels oh, off again. Yeah, here he comes. comes. He says, okay. And there goes his car. That's Darlington. Fireworks. Burton is really John at Kyle Busch. He said I didn't race him very nicely. So um, I guess all that uh, nice respect stuff he talked about earlier in this week's out the window. If you don't like that kind of racing, don't even watch. Now, I've never it, seen anybody pick on a race car and nobody <laughs> in it. <laughs> it's just hard to forget Harvick's car rolling away. But <laughs> one thing you got to admit, though, when it comes to rivalries and the tools you need to make a good one, it seems like Kyle Busch has all those pieces and parts. Well, he does. And, and at the end of the day, a good rivalry, to me, has got to have some amount of success involved with it. Well, Kyle Busch is up front every week in everything that he races. He's bound to have run-ins at some point with his competitors on the racetrack, and, and we've seen that there. He doesn't back down either. He's, he's going to definitely stand his ground. No one doesn't discriminate either. We saw him making fun of the <laughs> fans why. after that one race. He said, if you don't like what we're doing, go home. That kid's got so much passion, so much talent behind the wheel, you're bound to ruffle some feathers as fast as he drives that car and with the attitude that he has. I've said this many times about Kyle. He, he hates losing more than he enjoys winning. <laughs> and, and to the point of not discriminating, you see he had run-ins in all three of the series. But when you look at that list, Michael kind of touched on it. I think we left the biggest ride off that list for Kyle Busch, and that is the fans. When they boo him, <laughs> it drives him. It motivates him. And, and I, I just love the fact that he doesn't back down from anybody. Well, once he picked a fight with Dale Jr. years ago on the racetrack, he, he solidified that the fans were going to boo him some for a while there. You know what he and should do? Invite everybody down to the Kmart parking lot. Maybe to have a little bit <laughs> Why not? Just have, have, have a hug. It's been we'll done before, I can tell you that. Yeah, but it's, <laughs> but it's not about hugging and getting along here on this show. Coming up, our countdown of the best ride rivalries continues. Kurt Busch has had his fair share of disputes over the years, but there is no doubt about which one tops the list. Plus, which of the Intimidators rivalries will make it onto our list? I got to him and he turned him around. So didn't mean to really turn around, meant to rattle his cage over. Kurt Busch's paint scheme throws back to himself 15 years ago in 2003. It was at Darlington, Kurt and Ricky Craven put on a show for the final few laps until a drag race off turn four produced the closest finish in NASCAR history. Now, Kurt is certainly known for how hard he battles on the track, and sometimes his emotions get the best of him, which is why he's at number eight on our top 10 rivalries list. He just goes down in the dirt and goes by the 26. Evidently, Jimmy didn't appreciate that. Jimmy gives him a little boot. Jimmy goes up in the corner, scoots him up out of the way, and adios. He had a big bullseye back there, and I guess he couldn't see too good. And Jimmy Spencer forgot about what he did to me at Phoenix last year. But some guys have to learn. They just have to learn the hard way. It's Kurt Busch with a hard crash. Oh, he's mad at somebody. We're here, and it's a red car. Jimmy Spencer. Qualifying we spawned and that put us in a bad position back there with the decrepit old has-beens, I guess. I don't think Kurt's gonna help Jimmy out. Oh, oh touch, touch, hit, hit. What happened last week was an assault after the race. And he came up, hit me in the rear, and then he came up to my window and punched me. And I don't respect Jimmy Spencer. 
At number seven is a very different type of rivalry, not one defined by crashes and fights, but wins and championships. When Jeff Gordon exploded onto the NASCAR scene, it was Dale Earnhardt's territory that quickly changed in 1995 when Jeff won his first championship. Dale Earnhardt chided him about how young he was, so Jeff toasted Dale with milk during his speech at the banquet that year. Jeff signaled a new era in NASCAR, but the two always had great respect for each other. Jeff even carried the Intimidator's flag after tying him in career wins at Phoenix. So there we have as our number eight and number seven rivalries, two guys, two of those guys are very different. One involves disrespect and one involved respect. And I just love what Larry said. Sometimes the fun ones are when they're competitive and they use the verbal jabs back and forth. Not what we saw from Spencer and Kurt Busch. That, that's not a whole lot of fun for me. It <laughs> no. certainly is entertaining. Yeah, it's entertaining. I, was, I was entertained by it. Yeah. It's not very fun for their teams either. Exactly. <laughs> but I just always appreciated the way that Dale, it was his world. And Jeff came into it and began to beat him. And that was hard for him to take. But yet he saw the talent, appreciated what Jeff could do behind the wheel. And they became good buddies. Yeah, it was Dale's territory because he'd won these races. He'd won several of his championships. And, and, and it was his. And here comes this young kid from California started stealing a little bit of that thunder and you saw the toast with the milk <laughs> that was kind of stimulated at the Brickyard in 95 when Dale won the Brickyard the second trip there and he said I'm the first man to win the Brickyard insinuating <laughs> Jeff was not a man when he won it back in 1994 so this was respect but more of hard racing and a war good of spirited yes no yeah. question friendly well and to me I, I was a fan of Dale senior so it was interesting as a kid to watch and see how a rivalry with that amount of respect and and how not necessarily having that one catchphrase that everybody sees that makes the clips, but maybe something that not everybody fully understood, the, the whole man thing that happened at the Brickyard or, or some of those yeah. other subtle little comments, how that could evolve a rivalry as well. And then the other end of the spectrum, yeah, we got Kurt and Jimmy, and, and that was just a, a all-out gloves <laughs> yeah, was a war. brawl when it was all said and done. And Dale participated in other rivalries as well, yeah, as well. that were a little bit more hit and <laughs> crash and burn. Exactly, yeah. So that's only four, guys. we got six to come. And up next, his nickname was Jaws. And for good reason, Daryl Waltrip could icky shuffle his way into a rivalry with anyone. Plus, the King was unstoppable in his career. Well, almost. Where does Richard Petty's greatest rivalry stack up on our list? Stick around, find out. Welcome back to NASCAR Race Day from Darlington Raceway. The throwback schemes are everywhere this weekend, including this one for Brad Kozlowski. It's a throwback to the 1990 Miller Genuine Draft Scheme run by Rusty Wallace. And it's quite fitting since Rusty finds himself on our list at number six. They touch, Waltrip is sideways. Wallace drives through, Waltrip spinning to the infield grass. Darrell Waltrip with the brakes locked up, sliding down the front straightaway grass as Rusty Wallace continues on. Rusty's move in the 1989 All-Star Race may have gotten him the win, but it forever changed his relationship with the fans. In that moment, he took off his white hat and became a regular NASCAR villain. But not to be outdone, Daryl Waltrip lived up to his nickname Jaws when he said he hoped Rusty choked on his $200,000 prize. So, well, the crews got involved in it afterwards as well. And if you look really close in there, you'll see our friend Jeff Hammond in the middle of it all down there. Certainly uh, an image that we won't soon forget. And Rusty Wallace joins us now. Rusty, first of all, thanks for coming by today. We appreciate it. But, you know, you were never one that would hold back on speaking his mind. How did that affect the relationship between you and Daryl? Well, it didn't reflect. It, it, it didn't affect it a whole lot. Actually, the very following week, Daryl and I were getting along good. We're on a golf cart riding up down pit road together, and all the fans are like, "Man, I thought you guys hated each other." But I tell you what, it was just heat of the moment. I had an opportunity to pass Daryl, and I took it. I got the money. He didn't. He was mad, and I was happy. <laughs> and you didn't choke, right? He didn't choke. There's no choke. You're fine, right, Rusty? I, I, no, I didn't choke at all. <laughs> hey, yeah, Michael, I'm fine. And I told Daryl, he says, "I hope you choking at two grand. I told him, I said, I'm not going to, but I think it's 250. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Rusty, the thing I love most about you, not only the way you could wheel your stock car, but your attitude, your enthusiasm, your energy. How many times do you think your energy helped elevate some of these rivalries you were involved in? 
Well, I had a big mouth back in the day. I had to get calmed down a little bit. There's no doubt about that. I went into a lot of races, Michael, with a with a lot of confidence, and that got me in trouble a lot of times. But uh, you know, I had to learn from my veterans, and and your brother Darrell was one guy that did teach me. I learned a lot of stuff I did wrong that day, and it was it was a real surprising deal for me to win that race and then go to victory lane and be all jacked up and be all happy. Then all of a sudden, later to find out that almost everybody in the grandstands was hating me. <laughs> <laughs> and I went from being so excited about racing to be, you know, I feel like I was fending for my life. I mean, they were so mad at me that night. It was unreal. It was such a tough night that after I won, they put me in an ambulance, took me out of the racetrack so the fans couldn't get me to rough me up a little bit because they were mad, man. Yeah, I think my mom and dad were looking for you too, bud. <laughs> well, when you choke them $250,000, when you choke them $250,000, they have to put you in an ambulance. So when we were planning this uh, show, Rusty, we almost were going to do a whole show on Rusty Wallace versus the world. But we decided against that. But outside of your rivalries, what's one that you've really enjoyed watching unfold? Maybe one from the past or maybe one possibly going on now. Oh, my gosh. There's so many of them. I keep thinking about the rivalry, rivalries I had. So to try to think about ones I used to watch, <laughs> and, and I had a had to go back in the day and, and look at some of the stuff that Cale Yarbrough and David Pearson and guys like that I had happened to them. Mark Martin and I just finished a deal in here for the Hall of Fame, and, and we said if we could go back and watch any drivers, which one will we watch? And we both said Cale Yarbrough and David Pearson. Those guys were incredible what they did, and they were rivals, and they put on a heck of a show. But there was a lot of beating and banging as Michael well knows between you do too Larry between me and uh, me and Dale back in the day and, and I know Reagan was watching all that also but I mean I'll never forget uh, going to Wilkesboro one time and I've never break checked a person in my life except for this one fellow I'm about to tell you I came off a of turn two and Earnhardt kept beating on my bumper and I said I've had it I locked the brakes down and I break checked him he hit me so hard he knocked the nose off his car and I went ahead and finished second I think but I brake checked him because I was just sick of him, and I had it with him that day. Uh, but it was sure fun to look back and talk about. Well, you talk about all those old rivalries, Rusty, and, and what they were back in the day, whether it was Cal or yourself and, da and Dale and all the different ones. When we look at rivalries now, to me, they've become more tame, and it seems like they go away quicker. Why do you think that's the case? You know, I don't know. I don't know. We, we really took it serious back then, and we really – and really raced each other real hard, and these guys do too. But the drivers are much, much younger nowadays, and uh, they were older back then. Um, I, I don't know if we felt like we were kind of rougher around the edges than they are right now or what. But, uh, man, I tell you what, I used to love racing our Earnhardt so much, and I used to love getting out there with oh, Terry Labonte and those road courses and, and guys like that just really going at it. And people would call it a rival, but I wouldn't. I'd just call it just going after my competition, you know, uh, and just doing the best I could with them. But uh, nowadays, I really love watching old Harvick out there driving that car. He is such a smooth driver. You know, he's owned his own cars. He's built his own Xfinity cars. He's built his own trucks. You know, mechanically, he's probably one of the smartest guys in the garage. And so with him doing so well, I can appreciate that. But I also like watching my old two car. And tonight, that paint scheme that's going to race tonight is the paint scheme that I won the Coca-Cola 600 with. So I'm going to go back and I'll be pulling for that car a little bit tonight and, and watching for some of the new rivalries going on. Well, Rusty, thank you so much for coming by. It's always great to talk to a champion. Yeah, guys, thanks a lot. It's great being on your show today. And uh, I wish I was sitting in that cool air-conditioned <laughs> studio, but it's kind of toasty here at old 100-degree Darlington right now. But you know what? We're tough, man. We can take it. <laughs> you can if anybody can. All right, Rusty, thanks. And up next, Larry Mack talks about some of the recent run-ins on the track and whether drivers let their emotions show enough. It's McReynolds rant. And will Joey Logano make our list? That's how Joey races, so he's going to get it. And he's the one that drives like a little I'm going to bust his ass. His wife wears a fire suit in the family tells him what to do, so it's probably not his fault. Welcome back to NASCAR Race Day. We are counting down the top 10 rivalries of all time in NASCAR. There is Joey Logano's throwback car for today, honoring Steve Park's 2000 look. Joey Logano is looking to avoid drama today, but make no mistake, the number 22 driver is no stranger to controversy and finds himself at number five on our list. Side by side between Kevin Harvick and Joey Logano. Now Logano goes around. Harvick gets into it. Logano 
trying to save it. Joey Logano stopped out on pit road, confronted Kevin Harvick, very upset. Almost came to blows down on pit road. You know, his, his wife wears a fire suit in the family, tells him what to do, so it's probably not his fault. Logano jumps up in the groove right in front of Danny Hamlin and pow. Denny said, I'm not giving you a break, Joey. Tempers flared after the race. Hamlin out of line. There really wasn't much of a conversation. It was just me. How you finish it? Uh, I see he was coming for me. Hamlin edges ahead. They get it. They touch. They, they touch. touch. They go. Go. Hamlin spins down the racetrack. Tony Stewart is after Logano. Dumb little s runs us clear down to the infield. He's the one that drives like a little I'm going to bust his ass. Here comes a 22. And around goes the 20. It's hard to drive a car with rear tires off the ground. You guys meet hard, so I race them hard back. Matt Kenseth just wrecked Joey Logano. Payback for Matt Kenseth. Complete coward. You know, some days you're the bat, some days you're the ball. Uh, it's never fun when you're the ball. Chicken, you know what move. This is going to get ugly. It's going to get ugly down here, boys. And pushes around. Oh, there's a fight down here, guys. Kyle Busch and Joey Logano are in a fist fight. I got dumped. Flat out just drove straight in the corner and wrecked me. Any blows landed between the two of you? None to me. That's how Joey races, so he's going to get it. So probably one of the biggest things about Joey Logano is he came into the sport as the golden boy with the nickname Sliced Bread. And with that, that's got to make you somewhat of a target. Well, and I almost wonder if he can't maybe blame Mark Martin just a little bit for some <laughs> yeah. of this target that got put on his back. Mark gave him that nickname of Sliced Bread. Yes, the first couple years Joey was in the Cup Series. Maybe he didn't perform quite up to his expectations. But then when he started to, these veterans, they got kind of fired up at him pretty quick, and he was able to ruffle a lot of feathers fast. Yeah, and, and he stepped into that 20 car at 18 years old, a winning championship car. Big shoes. I think there maybe was even some jealousy. And Joey didn't back down. I think about his second win in 2012 uh, at Pocono, the guy that was promoting him, <laughs> he spun out of the way to win the race. Mark Martin, I think uh, he was driving maybe a car for MWR. <laughs> that was my darn car he knocked out of the way. <laughs> That was it's his, a great story, uh, though, except was, for your car. At least was, it didn't destroy the car. That was his boy, you yeah, know, and that was. boy got up there and shoved him out of the way and went to victory lane. And Mark Martin said, that's how you race these cars. There's a little bit of contact every now and then. I'm okay with it. But Joey Logano has not backed down from any situation. And what I'm loving about today's Southern 500, John, is it could happen tonight. Sure. We can see another uh, episode of Joey Logano versus whomever, and we can also see a new rivalry raise its head, and I just can't wait to watch this race tonight. All right, so let's recap. Let's take a look at all our top 10 rivalries so far. We've had Kevin Harvick and Greg Biffle, Kyle Busch versus the garage, <laughs> number eight, Spencer and Bush, number seven, Earnhardt and Gordon, Wallace and Waltrip, and we just talked about Joey Logano versus the garage. So Joey Logano is one of the few guys that has shaken things up in recent years, but Larry thinks there just isn't enough of it anymore, and it's the topic of this week's McReynolds Rant. You know, I've been in the sport of NASCAR for almost 40 years, and I've seen and, yes, been a part of many rivalries between two drivers. Sometimes they're spirited and friendly. Sometimes they can really turn a little bit ugly. I think good old-fashioned rivalries, that's what's missing today in NASCAR. And what makes me confident I'm right about this, there's a three-time champion that totally agrees with me. It doesn't matter what form of racing or form of professional sports. Those rivalries are what drive the fans uh, into that frenzy to, to watch each week. I don't see it changing anytime soon. We got a bunch of vanilla guys. I don't really understand why they're so tame and calm all of a sudden, but I can promise you if I wasn't retired, it would be different. No doubt, Tony gets it. I agree, everybody is way too vanilla and it really chaps old Larry Mack. Maybe they feel like it'll come back and cost him a championship as we fall, saw a few years ago with Joey Logano and Matt Kenseth or even last year in the playoffs with Chase Elliott and Denny Hamlin. Now pump the brakes. I don't want to see guys slinging jack handles around at each other, but a little beating and banging on the track, maybe a little war of words that goes longer than one race with two drivers. That'd be pretty cool and something I strongly only feel our fans would love to see again, and I don't want to hear nothing about those cell phones and texting on Tuesday <laughs> saying, I'm sorry I hit you. I'm sorry I wrecked you, yeah. and he didn't text me is what the guys say all the time. But hey, let's face it, guys, there is. like When you look back, this, one of the answers to this question might be, how much is on the line these days? Are you worried too much, Regan, as a driver to make anybody mad? Well, and, and I got to say, Larry Mack, preach on, because I agree with everything you just said right <laughs> there. I thought that was do. wonderful. I was and, getting 
nervous though. He gets all he's out. He does, he's gonna come hit us or something. I know, I know. But, but back it's all in good fun. If I hit you, I'd apologize later. <laughs> Don't text me, he buddy. Text you. Uh, but to your point, Jared, you do have to think. Back in the day, it would hit these guys in the wallet. Some of these guys were racing to put food on the table, and, and yes. I don't know that that's the case anymore with the majority of these drivers out there. And and possibly that's what it is. Is there's not maybe as much for these guys on the line. Maybe there needs to be. Maybe we need to hit them in the wallet a little bit harder. Look at the high-profile retaliation we've seen over the last couple of years with Logano and Kenseth. What that cost Logano, and with Joey, uh, excuse me, Chase Elliott and Denny Hamlin mm -hmm. took Denny Hamlin out of a champ to win a chance to win the championship. I think maybe it's elevated to a level now. You say I better be careful how I pick my battles because it could cost me a shot at winning the championship like you said, JR. But guys, on the flip side though, if you don't demand respect, if you don't command respect, maybe it comes back to you that way that somebody doesn't respect you and will take advantage. Well, I go back to Joey Logano. Until he finally stood up to some drivers, they just kept taking advantage of him. So absolutely, you have to make a statement that you know what? You hit me once, I'm going to hit you twice, maybe three times. <laughs> exactly. And I won't text you either. <laughs> Don't forget to tune into Race Hub. Both Michael and Larry will join Adam and Shannon tomorrow to break down the race from Darlington. Plus, Winner's Weekend. And on Tuesday, don't miss Radioactive Race Hub weekdays at 6 p.m. on FS1. Coming up, we've already seen him once, but the Intimidator is back for more. But which one of his rivalries places at number four? And Brad Kozlowski has had his fair share of run-ins. He's just a dip, you know I mean? The way he races, I don't know how he's ever won a championship. We're counting down top 10 rivalries this weekend. Austin Dillon and Richard Childress unveiled the number three throwback for today's race. It's a throwback to Dale Earnhardt Sr.'s quick silver scheme from the 1995 All-Star Race. And that car kicked off a trend of special paint schemes in NASCAR and seems to be very fitting once again this weekend. Now, there are really two very different types of rivalries. One is defined by respect, hard racing, and the other, will to win. The other has crashes, fights, and the hurling of insults. At number four and three on our list of the top 10 rivalries, we find one of each. Take a look. Waldrop keeps him straight, but he keeps uh, on tapping. Now Waldrop on the inside, it. side by side. Oh! Three comes around. Oh, beaten up. Waldrop thought he was going to victory lane. Instead, he's going to take that one over to the boneyard. Wild finish here at Richmond. So that wreck in 1986 signaled a start to a fierce rivalry between two all-time greats. They exchanged championships, wins, and words often through their careers, but eventually became good friends. Thanks to Daryl's wife, Stevie, and a pre-race tradition with Bible verses, their combined 160 wins and 10 championships was a defining era. Edwards and Keselowski. Can Keselowski try to win it? It's going to be hard to get him. It's going to be close. Apologize to Carl for wrecking him, but man, the rule is you can't go below the yellow line. And he blocked, and I wasn't going below it. Trouble on the front stretch. A car has slammed the wall, just going into turn number one. And that is the machine of Brad Keselowski. And that was a hard crash. I don't think there's any question in, in my mind that Carl Edwards took him out. You're right in the middle of the front straightaway. You know, Carl Edwards is one of the best drivers out there. Surely uh, he could have uh, not made contact with Brad Keselowski. Carl Edwards has been told, take your car back to the garage, put it on the truck, and go home. This is going to be down to the wire. Oh, I touch. He spun out. Carl gets into Keselowski. Oh, Carl Edwards will win. Flag. Oh, 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 man. Here, that's you a right? hard hit, guys. Boy, he was running great tonight. Carl flipped out like he did at Atlanta and tried to kill the kid. So I'll get my own damn uniform back on and take care of this. He ain't going to kill my boy. So, wow, that was a uh, intense one to say the least. But, Mikey, when you look back to your brother and Dale Earnhardt, our number four top rivalry there, um, when you look back at that, you had a front row seat to that. <laughs> you know, and those two really did not like each other when they both first showed up. Daryl showed up in his 
J.C. Penny slacks and penny loafers. <laughs> he was a talker. He liked to dress nice. And Dell Earnhardt was a rough guy from the South who wanted just to race you hard as he could. But that respect grew because of their performance. 12 years at Bristol, 24 races, either Daryl or Dale won 18 times the toughest racetrack. So their friendship was bonded and grown through the fact that they were fierce competitors, but they respected each other in the end. Yeah, as we've seen throughout the show, there are respectful rivalries among friends, but there's also guys some that have turned pretty ugly over the years. Yeah, I love hard racing and I love rivalries, but the Brad Keselowski, Carl Edwards one, it's one that almost got a little out of control. I was almost, almost. afraid somebody was going to end almost. up getting hurt on that deal right there. And it started right there as Brad won his very first race at Talladega in 2009. And this was the results at Atlanta. This is where, like, maybe this is getting a little out of control. But other than the deal at Talladega, it seemed like that Brad Keselowski was always on the short end of the stick of the rest of the things that went on between, the, between those two drivers. But the crazy part is if you ask Carl Edwards, he felt like he was on the short end of the stick and it cost <laughs> him more good runs than what it cost Brad. I know from my perspective, I was, I was one of the first cars through when that did Atlanta wreck happened and I'll be honest with you guys I was I was scared as to what had happened to Brad Keselowski that was a scary incident mm -hmm. there yes. and I don't know that we've ever I didn't even know that the car went upside down the way it did until later on that night so I, I'm glad that one's kind of gone away and is over with now I think it kind of started to end after Gateway but I'll guarantee you this those two guys there is no love lost between them to this day right now. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, could have gotten even uglier than it was. Now, we have just two rivalries left on our top ten list. Will this moment take the top spot? And there's a fight between Cale Yarborough and Donnie Allison. The Teppers overflowing. They're angry. They know they have lost. In case you are just joining us, let's catch you up on our countdown of our top 10 rivalries in NASCAR of all time. At number 10, we saw Greg Biffle and Kevin Harvick go at it. Number nine was Kyle Busch versus the garage. He had his fair share of run-ins over the years. Coming in at number eight was Jimmy Spencer and Kurt Busch. Number seven was two of the greatest of all time, the wonder kid Jeff Gordon versus the intimidator Dale Earnhardt. Number six, a throwback to the 1989 All-Star with Rusty Wallace, Darrell Waltrip. Number five spot was claimed by Joey Logano, taking on the garage. Number four once again featured Dale Earnhardt, this time facing off against Darrell Waltrip in a fierce but friendly rivalry. And at number three was the high-flying rivalry of Carl Edwards and Brad Keselowski. So just two more spots are available in our top ten rivalry. At number two, we find one of the most iconic moments in NASCAR history that defined not just an era, but a sport. Two of the greatest fiddling here, fidgeting with first place. It's all come down to this. Out of turn two, Donnie Allison in first. Where will Kale make his move? He comes to the inside. Between Cale Yarborough and Donnie Allison, the Teppers overflowing. They're angry. They know they have lost. And what a bitter defeat. And you'll just never forget that call. You'll never forget that sight. It was one of the huge moments in the history of the sport. Well, it must have been a rivalry because we're still talking about it almost 40 years later. But this was more, I think, Kale versus the Allisons. This had been going on for a number of years. It just came to a head in that final lap of that 1979 Daytona 500. You know, I love what Bobby said not too long ago. He did a show on Race Hub, and, and he said basically that in his mind, he could either get out of his race car and handle that right then and right there, or he could run from it for the rest of his life. And, and to me, that's words to live by. He got out of it, and he handled it right there, and it made for great viewing for all of us right there. It made great viewing for me from the infield. I was down You're there, there huh? on the fence watching this all unfold, and just the drama and the feeling it was in Daytona that afternoon, you knew something special had happened. I don't know that I thought that 40 years later we'd still be talking <laughs> talking about it, but yeah. wow, it was a fun afternoon. Yeah. And you know, at that time, little did we know what was in the future for NASCAR. Now, you have waited the entire show for this one, and as have we. Here it is, the number one rivalry of all time in NASCAR. As they come out of the fourth turn, about 750 yards to go. Oh! It's a straight away. They did hit. He's going to win it spinning, as he, I believe, will take the checkered flag. No, he did not make it. Pearson is going to try to make it across the finish line. Then he has his car going. Pearson's going to win it. I've never seen anything like that. It's unbelievable. 
It may be considered the greatest finish in NASCAR history as Pearson bested Petty that day, but it shouldn't be a surprise since this is the top rivalry in NASCAR history. That 1976 finish was one of 63 times that Pearson and Petty finished 1-2 in a race. Combining for 305 wins, 10 championships, these legends are two of the greatest to ever strap in to a NASCAR race car and have topped our list of the greatest rivals of all time. And that brings us to our Twisted T facts with a twist. And these numbers are somewhat astonishing. 550 races against each other. And look at the times that Petty and Pearson finished ahead of one another. The combined wins, 204. And look at the difference in the number one and two finishes, just three, as Pearson bested Petty in that one as well. So let's take a recap now at our top 10. Of course, 10 is Harvick and Biffle with the WWE move over the car. Bush versus the garage. Spencer versus Bush. Earnhardt and Gordon, Wallace and Waltrip. Joey Logano versus the garage is the number five. Then it's Earnhardt and Waltrip at four. Edwards, Keselowski, Yarborough, Allison, Pearson, and Petty. Guys, I'm a little bit out of breath. This is a lot of fun, but what do you guys think? Now, of course, everybody involved in NASCAR on Fox voted on this, the on-air people. What, do you agree with the way we came to number one? Do you agree with that choice? I'm, I'm happy with that battle because those two genuinely have won the most races in all of NASCAR. Yes. They had to have some mixed feelings over the years racing each other, so I'm glad it came down to Pearson and Petty. I, I think one that, in my opinion, that was left out that should be there was Darrell Waltrip and Cale Yarborough. He gave him the name, Jaws. You know <laughs> They had some issues together. Yeah, to me, there is no question that was number one. I think the numbers speak for themselves. And I'm sure they got together a lot, but most notably the 1976 Daytona 500. But I think an interview that was done with those two together by a member of the media pretty much said it all. The member of the media asked David and Richard, who's the greatest race car driver you ever raced? Richard immediately said, this guy right here, meaning David Pearson, quick pitted uh, witted Pearson said, I agree with him. <laughs> that pretty much sums it up right there. I, you know, I got to say, I, I don't know that I had that number one on my list, but it's purely because it was so far behind, before my time. But when you look at the numbers and you look at what both these drivers accomplished and how much they raced against each other on the racetrack, there, there's no denying that that's number one. And, and definitely amazing to me that they didn't ever have fisticuffs and they didn't ever get into it. It was one of those respectful rivalries like we talk about, and that is possible. That can happen. Yeah, and once again, that is why we're looking back this week and Darlington is so historic, and it's a great time to look back at all these fantastic rivalries. Now, there is a look at uh, today's paint scheme for Bubba Wallace in the throwback 43 car. He's run a different scheme each day. He'll look to put that one in victory lane. Up next, our picks for the best rivalry that didn't make the list. Welcome back to race day, everybody. We're counting down our top 10 rivalries. There you see number one, Pearson versus Petty. If you don't agree with our top 10 list, you can just reach out to Larry on Twitter. <laughs> or actually any of us, not just Larry. I was just, <laughs> just telling. So guys, here's the, here's the real question. You know, you look at those 10 and there's so many. Well, what sticks out to you guys as one of the rivalries that didn't make it? Well, for me, it was one of a guy, the guy that we talked to on the show earlier, Rusty Wallace, that him and Dale Earnhardt Sr. didn't make it. And, and I have vivid memories as a kid watching this race watching the anger that came out after this race between the two of those guys. So I was a little surprised it didn't make it. I had a couple of rivalries of my own, but uh, but glad they didn't make it. Yes, I, I list on its own. Let's check back in with Alan Kavana. Alan, what didn't you what did you think should have made the list that didn't? John, for me, it's personal. It's Rusty Wallace versus Jeff Gordon. Two times Jeff Gordon took Rusty out. Rusty only got him back one time. Jeff Gordon is our co-worker now, and when I see him, I am still angry after all of these years. If that doesn't scream rivalry, I don't know what does. Is there any question Alan Kavana is a huge Rusty Wallace fan? <laughs> I, I think that's that pretty okay. much got, got answered right here. <laughs> You're allowed to be fans. Well, and, you know, Alan, one, thank you. One that I was shocked that did not make the list is I go back to the late 80s, Jeff Bodine and Dale Earnhardt Sr. wrecked each other almost every week. In fact, it got so bad, Bill France Jr. brought them and their owners, Richard Childress and Rick Hendrick, and said, this is going to stop. You need to sport a whole lot more than we need you. And that's the Days of Thunder scene, I think. Well. <laughs> it's, that Robert, right? It inspired a movie. Well, guys, we certainly hope that this uh, episode of Race Day inspired you to think about not only the greatest rivalries over the years, but the fantastic history that NASCAR has had over 70 years on this throwback weekend. Sit back, enjoy this race, and again reflect on the great history that is NASCAR racing. So long.